I'm from the University of Denver. My name is Sierra Ashley, and my mentor is Dr. Adolf Witt. Um, I'll be talking about changes in the interstellar radiation field at high latitudes today. So there are three main sources of radiation um, in and around the galaxy. So the first is stellar radiation, which is just from stars. And then we have dust, which is technically just re-emitted starlight. And then we have a cosmic background, um, cosmic microwave background. So what I'm interested in is the dust emissions. So this is a simulation of um, spectral energy density of dust. So on the right over here, we have some black bodies that are corresponding to different radiation densities. And then on the left, we have unidentified infrared bands, which are constant in this model, regardless of the um, radiation density. So <clears throat> these correspond to the transitions of polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons, or PAWs, which is what we're interested in. Um, this is an example of a PAW, although the ones we see in interstellar dust are a lot larger. So we're interested in looking at the emissions from the PAWs and the large dust grains and seeing how those correspond to each other. So we looked at data from the WISE telescope, and we used the W3 data, which is a 12 micron range from about 7 to 17 micron, which um, corresponds to that unidentified infrared band that we were looking at. Um, and then we use EV minus V revenue map from IRAS to uh, normalize the WISE data. And finally, we use the dust temperature map um, created using a modified black body curve that's fitted to IRAS and derivative data. So as far as data analysis, we use DS9, which is um, an energy program where you can look at each of the maps individually. And what we did is we first looked at the temperature maps and created contours, and then um, placed regions on areas of varying temperature. And then we could place those regions on the EV-V and the Y's maps to compare each region individually. So we used fun tools, which is kind of an add-on to DS9, to get the counts and pixels in each of the regions. And then to get the temperature, we took the counts over the pixels in that map and cast over pixels to get the magnitude of the EV minus V, and then the same thing for the Y's data on the bottom there. And that's just an example of what you get out of fun tools. So these are some of our results so far. Um, so on the X, we have the temperature from that dust temperature map, and then we have the PA emission, which is the normalized Y's data. So we have this nice linear correlation between the two, and this shows that as the temperature rises, we also see an increase in the number of pollen emissions we see, which tells us that there is a, an increase in the radiation density in these regions. So going on from that, we have the pollen emissions versus the amount of extinction we see in the regions. So this is kind of the pollen density of the dust, and that will cause the light from different sources to redden. And so as we have more redding, we also see an exponential decrease kind of in this data. Um, in the amount of PAW emissions we see. This is more evident when we look at each region individually, and these are the log plots of the PAW emissions versus the EV minus B. So you can see this kind of exponential decay in all of these different ones. And this tells us that not only the energy density is changing in these regions, but so is the spectrum, because um, UV photons are more susceptible to the extinction, so we see a lot less of them when we have more extinction. So our next steps are to further explore these trends that we've already identified and look at these regions in more detail to see what kind of sources are in and around them. And then we want to look at regions with a lot different um, energy density and spectrum to see how variations occur. Um, we're going to look at the Pleiades and see how the high UV intensity in this region affects the PA emissions and if that correlates with what we've already found. And I'd just like to say thank you to Rick and my mentor, Dr. Witt, for all your help so far this summer. Any questions? Sierra? Yes, Steve. Um, I saw one. In one of your last slides, you said Polaris, so that's clearly a region that has been identified. Mm -hmm. But for the others, are most of the tiles that you've analyzed so far just regions where there's no identified interstellar feature, or? Um, for the most part, yeah. So we're just, okay, so we're just looking at regions like in underneath and above. 
Yeah, they're just kind of regions that we found that had good structure in the dust that would give us good temperature ranges, and so we kind of like fill that temperature range out. Um, well, why do we why do we care about pot emissions? So the pot emissions kind of tell us how the spectrum is changing in the region. Mm -hmm. So they only so they're small enough that they only absorb and um, UV photons and then re-emit in the infrared. So when we see them, we know that there's a certain amount of UV photons there. So in those areas where we see okay, where we see less of these pot emissions, we can say that there are less UV photons, and we think that's due to extinction in the dust. All right. So oh, yeah. scatter which you see is how much it depends upon the industrial radiation field intensity. Sorry, is, but, is it all is the radiation field intensity is almost constant in all these regions? The radiation oh no, we had a difference in magnitude of about three, I think. Is that correct? Yeah. All right. Let's thank Sierra again. <laughs> All right.